What is up, everybody? Zbot here with John Steffenhagen. And everybody out there, John is probably saying, who is John <laughs> Steffenhagen? Well, we're going to be in for a treat today, everybody. We are essentially retelling the story of the National Football League in a way that I don't think everybody knows it. Or there's no way they could know it because John has memorabilia, as you can see in front of us, that rewrites the story of the NFL. John's great-grandfather, Leo Lyons, just so happened to co-found the NFL. And he, John was kind enough to invite me into his home, listen to this story, and then share it with all of you. So welcome in. This is the first time I'm hearing it. I'm sure this is the million times John's told it, but it feels like the first because he gets yeah, get excited. You get excited. And, John, let's just start off right off the bat with – who you are, your background, and then we'll take it from there because, I mean, as you can see, we could probably sit here yeah. for 12 hours. Easily, yes. But we're going we're gonna to take it a step at a time and see how it goes. So, John, introduce yourself and, and, and give the background of, of, you know, how we got to this today. All right. Well, my name is John Steffenhagen, and my great-grandfather was Leo Lyons, who was born in 1892, and his incredible story – was not known to me until I was in high school and he left me a box of things. And so that's what started me off in this discovery of who Leo Lyons was because I never heard of him. Um, my mom would tell me, you know, he was involved in football, but it just got crazier as we, as she was starting to tell me things. Um, for instance, I'd be over, Leo passed away when I was nine. And so when I was six and seven years old, I'd be over at his house. Well, ever since I was born, or I was born, I was there. So um, I remember being a kid playing with my Hot Wheel cars when I was six or seven. And I remember my mom saying, shh, Leo's got company over. So I looked, and I remember these two old guys with a hat. They had a cigar in their hand and suits. And Leo and went, went out with the two other guys out on the porch to, to smoke cigars. So I just knew him as a bunch of old guys. But then later my mom had told me, oh, that was the owner of the Pittsburgh Steelers and the Chicago Bears. And, again, she told me at that time, I'm like, oh, okay. You know, again, not realizing who they were until I got older. And then a story kind of hit my head. I'm like, mom, was that the owner, George Hallis, and the owner, R. Rooney? And she's like, yes, those, those are his good friends, and they were over that day to – smoke a cigar, and, of course, she tells me, oh, that's nothing. Vince Lombardi used to be over to his house when he was younger, and Jim Thorpe was also over for dinner back in the, the 1900, early 1900s after he'd won the Olympics. I can't imagine sitting in the room playing with my <laughs> Hot Wheels knowing that just a few doors down, NFL royalty is smoking cigars with your great-grandfather. Yeah, yeah. What was it like for you, because you were telling me before we sat down here, you were just kind of giving me as much of a rundown as you could. And believe me, I mean, we, we, we haven't scratched the surface. I told John, I go, wait, save it. Let's hit the record button and make sure we get everything <laughs> on air. But the one thing that stood out to me right off the bat that you told me is that the legacy that your grandfather created. Great-grandfather. Within, great-grandfather, right. excuse me. Within the National Football League and to what it became, it wasn't well-known by you or your family, you really just uncovered all of this fairly recently. Before we dive into everything, what was it like knowing so many years later that your grandfather, or great-grandfather, I'm going to keep doing that, I'm sorry, your great-grandfather <laughs> was who he was? Yeah, it just, again, back when I had these things in a box and going through them, it was 1980. There was no Google. I couldn't, you know, search on the, you know, find stuff. I'd go to the library. I don't see Leo anywhere, you know. So, again, I just thought to put the stuff back in a box and kind of like, oh, that's cool, some cool stuff. And, again, it, for probably decades, you know, again. But then once the Google came about, I could actually remember the day me and my mother sat down and we started Googling it. I think it was when Google had just come out. And we're like, we type in Rochester Jefferson's Leo Lyons. So, you know, these things start popping up from the Hall of Fame. Leo, one of the co-founders in 1920 that started the league. I'm like, 
what? I'm like, this can't be. I'm like, no. So then I, I pan down to another thing from, you know, NFL.com. Oh, yeah, Leo Lyons, one of the founders of the NFL and behind the opening of the Hall of Fame. And he was the league historian. I'm like, how can this be? It's like, Mom, I go, didn't he tell you that he was all these things? It's like, well, he did, but, like, she wasn't a sports fan. Until yeah. this day, my family was a racing family. My dad was a race car driver. Everybody's into racing. Nobody liked football. I was the only kid who liked football. So that's that started – Everything and again, I get so confused as we're talking about it right now because this this kind of runs into so many tangents after that. So and my job is to try to navigate this. <laughs> I'm playing Lewis and Clark with John as we try to tell this unbelievable story. I feel like we have to start where it all begins, and that's by hearing who your great grandfather okay. was. Yeah, who was Leo Lyons? All right, let's do that. That's a, so much of a story. That people don't know. Um, well, and, and here's the thing that is the craziest part of all of this. Leo Lyons, who, and as I keep saying, we will get into what you see on camera here in a minute. He accumulated all of this based on the fact that he was a major part in getting the NFL to become the NFL. But he's not recognized as though he did that. You don't find Leo Lyons' name in the Hall of Fame. He's a tough find online. Like you mentioned, even for you, his great-grandson trying to right. find info, it's not easy. The goal here overall is to tell your great-grandfather's yeah, story. It's an absolutely incredible story. I feel like I'm watching a movie or reading a book as I'm going through this. So historians know this. Chapter one. Okay, historians <laughs> know about this. The yeah. NFL knows about this. But, again, it just gets – it's back in pages. So as I started researching, okay – Leo Lyons was a 16-year-old kid who joined the Rochester Jeffersons. The Rochester Jeffersons were a semi-pro team made up of just amateur Sandlot kids. So Leo joins the team. In, we'll explain later, journal notes that were found, Leo was obsessed with football. And he was always curious why there was no pro football league. And in his journal notes, you see him, he writes down major league football. He has it written as a 16-year-old kid when there was no NFL, he, he would bug his parents, like, why, why is there no pro football? And so wh what year is this around at this moment? 1906. Oh, my God. <laughs> it's okay. So, 1908, mm -hmm. he joins, 1906, he joins the team as a 16-year-old neighborhood, neighbor kid who lived on Jefferson Avenue. The Rochester Jeffersons had started in 1898 on Jefferson Avenue in Rochester. That's where they got their name. Mm -hmm. Back then, that's, they would, the neighborhoods would name the teams after the streets. Wow. So, Leo takes over the team as a manager two years later. 1908, he is now the player and manager of the team. He doesn't like the direction. Of, he, he gets it in his head. He wants to start a pro team. He wants to make the Rochester Jeffersons a pro team when there was no pro football league. And so he would write in the notes, I need to do something to stand out. So he gave the team uniforms. and Which and they didn't have at the time. They weren't wearing not, uniforms. Nope, nope. The kids back then, the Sandlots and Rochester, just had their shirt, just clothes. Mm -hmm. So he said, i, I got to give them a bright, yet bright, bright red uniform. I want to stand out. So then uh, two years after that, he takes over as the owner of the team because it was pretty much run by different men who were around in – in the neighborhood. So he took over as the manager and the coach. So now he's 20 years old and he is the player manager, coach and owner of the Rochester Jeffersons. But now I get to back up because again, I would, I need like notes to keep track of my things. We need Steven Spielberg in here okay, to wait. direct the whole thing. I got the best part. So, okay. That's 1910, 1911. There is a player by the name of Henry McDonald a black player. He is the first African-American to graduate from East High School in Rochester. That's the big high school in mm -hmm. Rochester. He starts his playing career for the Rochester Oxfords, another semi-pro team in the city. Leo's Rochester Jeffersons play the Rochester Oxfords two games during the season. Leo notices during those games that Henry is being treated unfairly by his own teammates. He would score a touchdown, an 80-yard touchdown, 
And they would all be high-fiving themselves, and Henry would walk back to the bench by himself. And he was also noticing, and as he wrote in his journal notes, that he was be call, he's being called black boy by his own teammates. And so he's, he noticed when they said that, that Henry would be kind of like he'd laugh and shrug it off. So at the second meeting that they met that year in 1911, after the game, the, all the players were leaving, and Henry McDonald was sitting on the bench by himself. So Leo walked over there and sat down next to Henry and said, listen, you realize that they're ma- making fun of you. And he's like, no, they're just funny. That's what he puts in his journal note. They're just funny. And he's like, no, they're, they're mocking you, and they're disrespecting you. He's like, if you join the Rochester Jeffersons, you will have a team, and you won't have to deal with that. You'll be treated like everybody else and not the color of your skin. The very next game he plays that season is with the Rochester Jeffersons, and that is the – he ended up playing the rest of the semi-pro up until 1919 until he joined Buffalo in 1920 uh, with the Rochester Jeffersons. And Leo and Henry McDonald remained lifelong friends. And I've got a photo of the two of them when they were like 80 years old. Wow. So it was a lifelong thing. So, And then there was an also in 1917, Henry McDonald was playing against Jim Thorpe's team in Canton, Ohio. And Henry McDonald got knocked out of bounds by – Greasy Neal he was. Historians know him. as I think he ended up coaching the Philadelphia Eagles or something when he was older. But he knocked Henry McDonald out of, out of bounds. And it's a famous scene that every historians know. Jim Thorpe walked over to, to the player that knocked Henry McDonald out of bounds and said, this is football. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. Like, we're here to play football. And that's the end of that. And supposedly nobody talked. And in Leo's notes, he said the rest of the game – the players were hardly tackling. <laughs> they were as scared because Jim Thorpe was like a mythical person. Even then, right. it's like when he talked, he's like, in his notes, he goes, he was a ma- man with among boys. And he said after that, like, Henry had no problem being, you know, I think they gently sent him to the ground when he ran. Those are Henry McDonald's. McDowell, is, is it? McDonald's. McDonald's, excuse me. Those are his cleats. Henry McDonald's cleats. From 1917, the game that w- he was knocked out of bounds by this greasy Neil, and Jim Thorpe said that. Wow. Leo's journal notes, as we talked to later, which were recently found, tell me that those were his cleats. And I think, oh, do we want to talk about it now, how I found out those were the cleats? We can, but let's preface. <laughs> Henry McDonald is the first African-American. One of the first. One of the first African-American players. Yes. In both uh, professional football. In, in professional football and as well as the, the Not the junior. NFL. Okay. No, professional football. So in professional football in general. Yes. Okay. And Hall of Fame recognizes him. He's he's on the wall at, in Canton. Again, Leo's not, but Henry right. McDonald has a big picture of him as one of the first African-American players who played on the Rochester Jeffersons. Not Leo recruited him. But that's that. But, yeah, these are his shoes. So, so let's talk about the shoes because you, you, you know <laughs> the story of where these came from. Okay. I'm trying to think we're going to skip ahead. So I guess we're going to be bouncing around. There's a lot here. All right, we'll explain after. So once I had found this journal and we learned that there were shoes that were his, I've had these cleats since I was from the 1980s when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. Always thought they were Leo's shoes. Would go around to the shows and and I was interviewed on TV. These These are Leo's shoes, you know, because I just figured they were. You know, there's no markings on them. They look like he he wore those shoes. So when these new things came out and there was an inventory list, uh, I contacted the Smithsonian who saw my pictures on LinkedIn. And so I told them about these shoes. And they're like, are there any initials on the shoes? I go, well, I've looked briefly. I go, I don't see anything. She's like, well, back, back then in 1911 or 1917, uh, they didn't have permanent markers, so they would scrape their initials into the leather. So this is black leather. She's like, you're going to have to take your flashlight and shine a bright, bright light on it and turn it into the light, and you, you, if there's initials there, you'll see them. So, <laughs> like, it was like, it was, it, was, it was insane. So we were at this table, and my wife was there, and we're, we're going through the shoes. We're like, all right, let's let's look at these shoes. I just got home from work. And there was a guy on the phone because I was telling him, I got these shoes. They go, they might be Henry McDonald's shoes. And so he's like, well, let me know. So he calls me while we got the shoes on the table. 
So we have a flashlight, and we're you know we're shining around. We look in the first one. Uh, we see some scratches. We're seeing it could be a letter. No, nah, I don't think so. So <laughs> she's she's looking at it, and all of a sudden she goes, "Wait, I think that's an an M." I go, "No." I go, "Are you serious?" And so she looks at it, and she's shining it down there. I'm like, "Yeah, that looks like an M." And then she goes, she starts looking again, and I she goes. Oh, my God. I go, no, don't tell me. She goes, there's an H. I go, these were Henry McDonald's shoes. Wow. So this was just last month that I learned that yes. these are Henry McDonald's shoes. But Henry McDonald is a guy that you almost can't tell the story of how the league came about without him, especially when you're talking about. One of the first players. Right, especially when players. you're talking about the, the, the racial impact that was right. involved within the sport at the time. And here you are. You sit down. And you figure out that you have what is inevitably a major piece of football history. Yeah. I mean, they're literally cleats nailed on with nails. If we look at, take a better look at there's actually nails sticking out of a few of them. And there's actually still dirt in them. Wow. So I looked uh, through all my photos because I have maybe, I don't know, 100 photos from the NFL. Yeah. And memos and things. And so we had looked and I had found this picture of Henry McDonald. And if I look wow. closely, I see that it is in a black high, high top shoe with the big knob cleats and a circle on the side of the shoe, which matches exactly the shoes that I have. Unbelievable. <laughs> so we sidetracked into Henry McDonald from the origin story of your great grandfather. So we left off <laughs> where your great grandfather at 20 years old is now owner, player, Manager, coach. manager, and uh, he he was involved in the in the health sector of the team as well. Uh, team doctor, yes, team photographer. He actually set up the fields again. I can run in tangents. Right, Walter Hagen. Yep, who won I think eleven golf championships. <laughs> I don't know how many he won. He grew up in Rochester. Mm-hmm. He was the same age as Leo. Those two would set up the fields, the sand lots for football games. This is pre NFL. Yep, back when they were kids. And wow. then later, they didn't keep in contact because he became rich and famous as a pro sure. golfer. But it was kind of neat that he those two were setting up the fields. Yeah. Uh, he would actually cut out the goalposts of two-by-fours, and that was your goalposts, right. and then the benches he had to set up. And basically, he was a, fra- he was a walking franchise. The Democrat and Chronicle listed him as that in the headline, Rochester's own walking franchise. It's amazing as we sit in Rochester right now, many of you sit in Rochester watching Buffalo, all these amazing historical elements of of the game we all love right down the road that I feel like is almost never discussed. And that's the main goal right here is to try and bring this to light, especially when you're so close to the situation. So let's go back to your great-grandfather at this time when he's playing all of these different roles for the Rochester Jeffersons. Mm -hmm. How does this wind up then translating Mm -hmm. into getting into the National Football League that we've come to know today? All right. So his obsession continues. Now he he has in journal notes that I wrote, he actually had a step-by-step plan. He has number one, be the best in Rochester. Number two, be the best in the state. Number three, be known to the Ohio League, which was the only place where they were playing fo- um, football, the Canton Bulldogs. It was a, that was the only hotbed of football in the country. Mm-hmm. And then four, become a national, be a, be a part of a pro football organization. Wow. Now, this, again, is in his early 20s. Yeah. So – what does he do? He gets the best team, best players in Rochester. He kills every team in Rochester. He starts picking teams, players from Buffalo, Syracuse, Watertown. And then in 1916, he wins the New York State Championship, which is that trophy right there. Which, this big silver guy. Which has a story. Which Everything if it's off camera story. right now, I'll make sure you guys okay. can see it. But that's the trophy in that 1916. That's the trophy, which says on there, Rochester Jefferson's New York State Champions. Uh, yes. Wow. So he accomplished that. So he, he, his step, one of his steps was done. Now he knew he had to be known to the people out West. So Jim Thorpe and the Canton Bulldogs are the biggest team in the country. Mm -hmm. They're crushing teams, 80 to nothing, 70, nothing. There's no, nobody can even compete with them. So what does Leo do? Leo writes to Jim Thorpe and says, we are going to come out there. We want to play you and we're going to beat you. And so Jim Thorpe's like, who, who is this kid? Who, who is this 
from Rochester. I've never even heard of them. So he, and Leo says, we're the New York State champions. You know, we want to challenge you. So the Ken Bullocks basically were never challenged. Like, no one ever came to him. And later on in life, when they were friends, Jim Thorpe admits that was that caught his eye right there. He said, you had the balls right. to, 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 to challenge me to a game. So Leo takes his team. Now, that's not easy because World War I is going on. It takes 11 of his starters are drafted for the war. Wow. Okay? So he goes out to Canton anyway, doesn't care. Jim Thorpe even tells him, are you sure you want to play me? You lost 11 starters. Whatever. I don't care. We're still going to beat you. <laughs> so he goes there. They play the Bulldogs. They lose 41 to nothing, which is respectable considered <laughs> they had beaten the Buffalo team 80 to nothing, I right. believe it was, the year before. So after the game, uh, this is the same game that Henry McDonald was knocked out of bounds. Uh, Leo and Jim Thorpe are coming off the field. And this is known by historians. This isn't known by just me and – but Jim Thorpe and autobiographies know this happened. The two are walking out the field, and Leo says to Jim Thorpe, I want to be in a pro league. I hear you guys were talking about it. He goes, and then Jim Thorpe goes, yes, we're, we're, we're starting to think about starting a league. Now, this is three years before the NFL. Mm -hmm. So Leo goes, here's my phone number, here's my address, and get a hold of me. And I, well, they, So they exchanged addresses and phone numbers. And he's like, I, I want to be in. No matter what you do, call me. I want to be in. That's what Leo tells Jim. So 1918 rolls around. We got the Spanish influenza. Ironically, <laughs> we're dealing sure. with the uh, things now. They only play two games. Leo goes to Detroit, plays a game in Detroit. Three players are stricken with the Spanish influenza, which was an epidemic at the time. Uh, one of them on the way back had to be quarantined. Now, this is the time where there are no airplanes. Yeah. <laughs> so they traveled by train. So they had to come back from Detroit with one player who had this influenza, and they had to keep him in the back of the train. So, again, from the journal, I, I know these things. Thank you so much, everybody, for tuning in to this episode of The Smoke Break, a special interview feature with John Steffenhagen. This interview is brought to you by manscaped and the all-new lawnmower 4.0 yes just when you thought it couldn't get any better from manscaped and their grooming products here comes the lawnmower 4.0 and this thing is an absolute beast it has an all-new multi-function on off switch that you can engage with a travel lock so it's created for people who are constantly on the go like most of us are the Lawnmower 4.0 also gives you the ability to turn on a massively powered LED spotlight so you can get a very precise shave no matter whether you're in the dark or the light. The new trimmer also allows you to customize your trim through additional guard lengths with one to four different sizes. And the way it looks, it's sleek, stylish, and looks great in the bathroom as almost a centerpiece of sort. The Lawnmower 4.0, it doesn't get better than that from a male grooming perspective, and it comes to you from Manscaped. Use the code FANATICS at checkout at manscaped.com to get a discount on your order. That's FANATICS at manscaped.com to get a special discount on your order. So 1919 rolls around. Leo is, he's, he's again, keeping in contact. Leo's journal notes, which he dated, it's Jim Thorpe's address from Oklahoma, from the reservation, <laughs> where he was from. The uh, the biographer and stuff for for Jim Thorpe is like, oh my God, you have his ad that that's his address. It's like nobody would know that, it's right? Like, yeah, well, Leo did. Yeah, and so yeah, I got Jim Thorpe's phone number. <laughs> I mean, we're talking like, about a guy who has a town name after him, right? Right, right. <laughs> so, Jim Thorpe. You know, again, it, it, communication was so tough, right? You know, because you didn't have computers, you didn't have televisions. You know, the media was so slow. So, 1919, uh, Rochester and Buffalo play for the championship for New York State, and I have the program, which is extremely rare, the right. Buffalo Prospects versus Rochester, and they played in an ice storm in Rochester, and Buffalo won. So, Buffalo got that over on Rochester for 1919. Yep. So, uh, so, there we go. So, now we're entering 1920, um, in August of 1920, Four teams in Ohio, 
are talking about starting a league. Leo even tries to get there. Of the four teams that were there, they were all from Ohio. There was Canton, Dayton, Akron, and Muncie. I can't think of the other one. But mm-hmm. so, but historians know that Leo actually sent a letter to them saying, I can't be there. I'm working three jobs. <laughs> Which to support the team, he was also the only financer of the team. So he was, he was funding everything. Yeah, well, yeah. Again, I forgot everything. Yeah, he was working three jobs to to keep up with to be able to pay for train trips and sure. and players and such. So he um, he says I can't be there, but I, I want to be part of the league. He was so worried about getting in, you know. So I was like, that's pretty cool. So then a month later, they set up the uh, the date for September seventeenth, nineteen twenty, the forming of the NFL at the Hupmobile Showroom in Canton, Ohio. So. I get these journal notes we were talking about. I have a journal note that says four days before they formed the league, Jim Thorpe, a dinner with Leo in Rochester. So I'm like, that, that can't be true. <laughs> it's like, you got to be kidding me. So I get on the computer. I look at newspapers.com. I had to fill out a, for subscription. I'm like, I, I got to yeah. check this date. I look at the date. Sure enough, the headlines in the sports section say Jim Thorpe was playing for the minor league team in Akron and they were here in Rochester for the Rochester Red Wings, which were called the Rochester Ramblers, I believe. He was playing right field for the baseball team. It says Thorpe Thorpe meets with Leo Lyons about football happenings. And in that article it talks about the two of them, you know, talking football things and starting the league and things. So and then my mom tells me that my great grandmother remembers her t- telling her a story of Jim Thorpe, that famous Olympian that went to Sweden was over for dinner with Leo. <laughs> wow. So this is four days before they start the league. So. <laughs> four days later. Four days later. What happens? Four days later, Leo is on his way to Canton, Ohio. Uh, he shows up at the Hupmobile showroom with George Hallis and nine other men to start the league. It's during Prohibition, and it was – near Chicago, which was the, the big Capone. We're talking about a yeah. you know, big thing. And so the only thing that's ever been seen from that meeting are two pieces of paper that the Hall of Fame has of the actual meetings and the times and who was there. Well, come to find out I have 10 pages of Leo writing about that night, <laughs> including hiding the beer from the police because it was during prohibition right and him saying thank god ralph hay who is the owner of the car dealership knew the police <laughs> and the stories later on joked if they, they if they had gotten arrested the nfl might have not happened oh my god so, so if the dealer if the owner of the dealership didn't know the police right we, this wouldn't we wouldn't even be talking right it wouldn't have happened that day anyway but yeah just incredible wow. so as i'm reading the notes he's given details of you know, this person looked nervous. I mean, he's given it's like reading a book. I was just when I read it, I, I just I like I wanted to I actually uh, I called uh, an author from Buffalo, Jeffrey J. Miller, who's written books with Marv Levy. Mm-hmm. And uh, I, I told him, I, I think it was almost midnight. I'm like, Jeff, you're not going to believe what I've got. I go, I've got accounts of the NFL <laughs> starting. It's like and he was just he's been floored. He's been following this. And he's like, oh, my God. It's like almost it's almost like hearing about somebody <laughs> journalizing the <laughs> Declaration of Independence right, being the, signed. Yeah, like that's uh, how I feel uh, as you Thomas, tell me this Thomas story. Thomas Jefferson looked nervous. Right. Or, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about this journal, which you have. You have the journal. Your great grandfather kept incredible notes on absolutely everything from beginning to end in regard to the formation of the league, down to the last detail. Like you just said. Noting guys were nervous right, in the room. Right. Yeah, sick the first six seasons, which were the six seasons that Jefferson's played. And to your knowledge, this was not known by anybody prior to you finding these notes. Yeah, they had stories. There's been historians that have accounts from, you know, George Hales, who was there. George Hales wrote an autobiography mm-hmm. about it. And um, actually, before George Hales came out with his autobiography, it was always believed that Jim Thorpe was at that meeting. And he was named the president, so they automatically figured he was there. Now, back at that time, the newspaper didn't really, it was just a little blurb, sure. you know, starting the NFL. So it was always thought so. And then when George Hales wrote his autobiography, he says that Jim Thorpe wasn't there. 
So that kind of had his story like, well, that's weird. So then in Leo's notes says Jim Thorpe wasn't there either. He was on a hunting trip in Oklahoma or playing baseball for the minor league team. But Leo was hoping that Jim Thorpe would be there. Yeah. But yeah, just, just crazy. What happens in this meeting? What is, what is noted in the notes is in regard to how it all came to fruition in, in this room? Well, they, it was basically just, it was only like an hour meeting or hour and a half meeting. That's and, it. Yeah, it was, it was, it was not like a, it was basically, they were, they were what, in their early 20s. So they're kicking back, having they're some illegal back, beers, beer like, let's start this league. In a car dealership. <laughs> a lot of them were just sitting, they said that they were sitting inside the cars that were for sale. They're all sitting in this showroom in Canton, Ohio, talking about starting the league. And that's how they did it. They each put in uh, $100, and they made rules. They said, well, you know, you shouldn't do this, that. It was very <laughs> loosely done. <laughs> this so, is just, I, you can't help but laugh. It's incredible right, right. To, to understand what, what this all was. So, so that meeting happens, and mm -hmm. the wheels are turning. Yeah. Where do things go from there? Okay, well... Uh, obviously, I can only tell things from Leo. Sure. Side, what he's doing. So, yeah. this is a at the point where Leo now knows that this is where okay, this is where Rochester turns on him. The fans. Mm. Rochester wants the Rochester Jeffersons to be local players. They want Jimmy down the street to play quarterback. It's like it's all local. Yeah. Leo says in the newspaper, "I can't be local to compete on a national level." So, oh, add to his his things. Uh, there was no draft. So he was the recruiter for the team. He would have to travel the country to different colleges and recruit, pl recruit players, take money out of his own pocket, and coax them to come play for the team. And he, in 19, a year later, 1921, he had like 15 All-American players from college on his team, and he did it all by himself. And, and at that time, I'm assuming it was whoever gets there first and yeah. it gives the best speech. Yeah, there's gets a the famous guy. there's a famous thing in his notes, and it was known that there was a guy named Benny Boynton who did play for the Buffalo franchise later on, uh, was working at a steel mill in Pittsburgh, and he was supposed to be the greatest quarterback coming out of Texas, but <coughs> excuse me, he was he was there at the steel mill. So Leo and his wife drive down to the steel mill and later get kicked out, but signs him to come to Rochester. And I guess in the Akron newspaper, they said the Akron pros who won the first season in the NFL was also trying to sign him, but Leo outbid him. So Does he so, know any monetary value that was dealt between the players? Yes. I don't remember. It's in the notes, but it was, it was something like a hundred dollars. Unbelievable. You know, a hundred bucks. To sure. Sign. Yeah. Yeah. And, and from that moment, you get these guys in. Does he discuss how the operations within the organization went down, such as, like, practices, games, yeah. all of that nature? Yeah. yeah, but I don't want to get into all this. I'm going to— Right. Yeah, I know there's so like, much. Yeah, it's, but it was just the, those, those six seasons. Yeah. Just to see the struggle that he went through. Right. I mean, he met with George Eastman at Kodak here. And it's he's unbelievable. like, why don't you support me? I, this is going to be big. Pro football is going to be big. And I have the article from the newspaper in 1921. Uh, they called Leo a fool. He's like, how do you think pro football is going to work? And Leo's like, look at baseball. There's Major League Baseball. Why can't there be Major League Football? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, he was always there, and they always laughed at him. And, and so that, oh, yeah, going back. See, I go on tangents. Yeah. So we go back, go back. So – that's what happened. Rochester turned against him. So he would end up bringing big stars into Rochester. The more he did that, the less the fans came out. Wow. So by the last two years, nobody came out to, the, to see their game. He said he couldn't give tickets away. And he would have some of the best talent in the country. But Rochester wouldn't support him. And actually the final year, 1925, they were extremely uh, – they were just totally a road team because they couldn't draw. Wow. Because so the wall, so it was, it was nobody wanted anything to do with it, it no. as long as it was outside of yep. the talent was, was outside Rochester of Rochester nothing. and it would be in the newspaper all the time. I don't know why he's ruining it. This is a good franchise. Why is he bringing in all these college stars? Yeah. It's like, well, to Leo it made sense. You're you know? right, but, of course. But to them it didn't. Does so. he note his personal conflict with this, like his internal conflict, knowing what he was not, doing was right? Not, no, I mean these the, this journal itself. It's not like. 
like big paragraphs. It's more notes, like mm -hmm. a sentence. He just jots down stuff. So it's like pieces in here. So no, there isn't like a like a discussion, like his right. his, his thing. That, but he had to have been frustrated. Sure. So this journal itself, I mean, this really, it, it's a blueprint to the beginning of the formation of the league. It was unknown prior to you getting your hands on it. Yes. You see it for the first time. You flip through it. Take me through what that was like. Just, just sitting there realizing, like, this is this is unbelievable. Out of my mind. Because also a lot of people don't know Red Grange. Okay. Okay. Well, no, let me go back even earlier. Run it back. <laughs> Let's talk about the Chicago Bears calling me at work. <laughs> Chicago Bears call. Yeah. I mean, that's not a call you get at work every day. No. So, so, you, so yeah, let's do that then because um, you find all this stuff. Okay. And so nobody knows about it. Okay. So, let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's go back to, I'm trying to think of the clearest way to do this. So, let's go back to where I have the items in the 1980s. Mm -hmm. Know it was cool. Start Googling it. Understand that that's that. Again, just thinking that this football is just from the team. Just think right. that these shoes were Leo's shoes. Everything I thought was just that box that's sitting there was just his bo a box he used. So all these things are just other things like the Art Rooney postcards. I knew right away that those were incredible. Sure. There were pieces that mixed. But it was just until recently as I moved that a memo, an NFL memo from Pete Rozelle attached to an inventory list – fell out of a program I had, which explained suddenly that what I was sitting on wasn't just stuff. It was one-of-a-kind, priceless memorabilia not seen anywhere else in the world. <laughs> and the wild thing is you you had had this for over 25 years. 40, almost 40. Almost 40 years. years. Figure the 80s, yeah, 1980. And so. none of it ever, it never really occurred to you what it could be worth, the history behind it. Telephone, or it was just a telephone. I always kept the things because I thought they were his antiques. And right. It was like I have a connection to Leo, so I'm not going to throw them away, sure. but I'm just going to keep them in the box. Right. So how these things actually made it, there's actually 20 pieces of one-of-a-kind memorabilia that, it, that has people around the world going, oh, my God. So let's talk about that. As you can see, the memorabilia is in front of us. You just recently realized – what all this stuff is. And yes. none of this stuff is known by anybody else. And most of this stuff here, there's nothing else like it on the planet. No. And you stumble upon it, the right. worth of it, the, the notoriety of it. And things are taken off for you in a way you couldn't Im imagine as far as like no. connecting puzzle pieces right. with other people who have great interest in this stuff. Let's talk about what's in front of us <laughs> and the story behind it. Well, this right here has a great story. This right here in this case is the oldest known NFL football in the world. Okay. Now, the I don't story, even feel worthy sitting next yeah. to it. <laughs> <laughs> and last year or the year before on One Bills Live, I was sitting next to Murph and Tasker, and Tasker was holding the ball because I thought it was just a football. And he laughed. He goes, geez, this must be worth some money. And uh, he's holding it, and he's like, that's really cool football. So I'm like, yeah, it's really cool. So <laughs> so, so then uh, at that time, I believe that it was from – it could have been from a Chicago game at Wrigley Field because, mm -hmm. um, oh, there was a newspaper article of Leo holding the football – holding a football in a 1935 newspaper article saying that this is the game ball from the Chicago Bears game. Mm -hmm. So – I thought it might be, but I knew if I was ever going to come out and say it, a fish like this is the game ball, I knew I had to have proof. I wasn't right. just going to say this ball is – this is the ball. So, again, I just kind of just let it go. And so when all this started up, um, this was actually before the inventory list came out. I started Googling this ball last year because it has a Wilson insignia with a W and a box going across it saying Thomas – E. Wilson and Company. So I Google it. It doesn't come up at all. So I'm like, well, that's weird. So I'm Google imaging it. I'm looking. I can't find anything on it. Not a mention of a ball like this. I thought that that's weird. So I sent an email to Wilson Sporting Goods in Chicago. Just sent a random email. I take a picture of it. 
I say, can anybody at, your, at this company let me know what I have in my possession? And so within less than 24 hours, I get an email from the president of the company saying, oh, my God, Mr. Stephen Hagen, uh, do you know what you have there? And I'm like, yeah, an old Wilson football. He's like, no, let me tell you. <laughs> He's like, uh, I have never seen a picture of one other than in a catalog. Uh I don't believe there are any of those. And if they are, it's like maybe a collector has one. But what you're claiming this ball is, because I told him I thought it was from the Chicago game. He's like, that's incredible. And so he goes, I will get you a hold of Skip Horween. Horween Leather makes the football leather today for mm-hmm. Wilson footballs. They have for 100 years. His great-grandfather, Skip Horween, Played against Leo. He played for the Cardinals in 1923 against Leo. But I don't want to go on a tangent again. So I call Skip Horween at Horween Leather. Oh, my God. He's even oh, my God. me. He's like, yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a Wilson football from, like, 1900s. I go, he's like, how do you have it? And I tell him, well, I was. Leo's. He's like, that's, that's unbelievable. He goes, that actually, there's a two and a five underneath the logo. To come to find out that that is the catalog number for the top collegiate ball in 1920s. And the NFL would have been using the top collegiate ball because the NFL was just starting. There wouldn't be an NFL ball, obviously. Right. So I come to find out that that is that. And now, over the last few months, I have talked to historians with the Chicago Bears, Decatur Staley's, the Arizona Cardinals, all the NFL teams and historians – and no one can find anything even close. The Arizona Cardinals have a ball from 1941, which is supposedly the oldest NFL game ball. So you're talking almost 20 years 20 prior. 20 years prior. And not only that. <laughs> it gets better. In the journal notes, I have a business card from Dutch Sterneman, who is a Chicago Bear player, and George Hallis is like co-manager uh, ran the team. <laughs> the, I, I was going to say I was going to get it, but I was going to look at it after. There's a c- business card. It says the Chicago Bears exclusively supplied by Thomas E. Wilson and Company Footballs from 1921. Ann and Leo's Journal Notes talks about Leo and George Hallis using the Wilson football. So the NFL didn't officially use Wilson footballs to the 40s where they were exclusively. Right. But Wilson was exclusively, Chicago was exclusively using the ball. And I have it. Uh, it, it <laughs> speechless is an understatement. Um, you, you're, you're painting history not only within the NFL. Wilson is one of the most iconic sports brands of all time, and you're holding unarguably the, the holy grail of Wilson memorabilia. Mm-hmm. So the people who work at Wilson themselves, I mean, how taken back were they at the fact that this was even in existence, let alone that you had one? Yeah, totally. They just told, and actually, like, I think a month later, because he goes, I'm going to ask around to some of the older people, and they're going to go look through the files and stuff if they can find. He goes back a month later, we don't even have files on the ball. He goes, we see a catalog. We see that it was the top collegiate ball. Number 25 was the collegiate ball. He goes, but... As far as, like, production or anything, he goes, over 100 years, they don't have anything from 100 years ago. Right. They right. never kept it. They even threw their papers away. Unbelievable. Away. So he's like, that, that's a start. He goes, with the evidence that I see that you have, he goes, I would 100% authenticate, and Horween Leather would say that that is a game ball. And with the pictures that you have, I would believe 100% that that's, that's authentic. So you have the knowledge of the ball now and, and sort of the origin of what it is. You're at work one day, the Chicago Bears ring you up. Yes. They're in just as much shock as Wilson was, I'm sure, right? Yes. Yeah, What's so, that phone call like? Yeah, so I look at my phone, and, I, and it comes up, Chicago Bears. So I'm like, could they be spoofing even that? You know, like the fake callers using a you know, right. fake name? Wait, it said Chicago Bears it said on Chicago your phone. Bear. I actually took a picture of it because <laughs> I couldn't believe it. I actually had to stamp it with my iPhone quick. I'm like, yeah. I can't believe this. I go, could it be the Bears? So, hello, Mr. Steffenhagen. Uh, this is so-and-so, an executive with the Chicago Bears. He goes, this morning, 
the whole front office in Chicago is asking, who the hell is John Steppenhagen and why is he holding our history on his kitchen table? <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. Yeah. So at this moment, the Bears organization is realizing that their history is being rewritten in uh, a way. You had found something outside of this ball in relation to the Chicago Bears that is unbelievable. And we're talking about the Bears, one of the most storied franchises in the NFL. Mm -hmm. You actually have documentation of when the Bears coined their name, the Bears. Yeah, so... Um yeah, first we were talking about the football. He had saw he saw the football. Yeah. He's like, he's like, you really think that that is from the Chicago Staley's Jefferson's game? I go, yes, I've got, I've got the football. I've got the notes, the journal notes. I've got an inventory list that's saying it's from that game. I've got a picture of Leo holding the ball, saying it's that. I go with all the evidence I've got. I'm like, yeah. I go, how many footballs do you have from? And I didn't say it like jokingly. I sure. Go, how many game balls do, do you have from the 20s? He goes, I'll be honest with you, Mr. Stephen Hagen, we don't. I go, I was taken aback. I'm like, you know, what? Yeah. I go, what do you have from the 1920s? Nothing. Other than George Halas's notes about, like, documents and stuff, like who, the, who got paid what, like, contracts. Mm -hmm. He goes, as far as actual pieces, none. And he goes, I don't believe there are anybody else that would have it unless a collector somewhere. But even if that was known, it would have been known to collectors that that was sold. Right. <coughs> Excuse me. So I talked to a historian with the Decatur Staley's, which the Bears started out with originally in 1920. He says the only piece of memorabilia they have is a helmet from a backup player. And that's like a prized possession in Decatur, Illinois, that they have a helmet from a backup player. And he goes, you're telling me you have all this? He was just blown away. So talk to me about the, so the you, notes. The no, that one <laughs> note, it, it literally says, by like in a, in, in a roundabout way, by the way, which you just said, so the Chicago Bears were the Chicago Staley's, which yep. I don't even know how well known that is. I don't think I knew that. Yeah, it started out as Decatur Staley's in 1920, yes. then Chicago Staley's in 21, yeah. and then officially in 1922, there was the Chicago Bears. You have a note that essentially says, by the way, we're going to be going as the Bears from now on, starting soon here. Yeah, so I put that uh, as we go off. LinkedIn, uh, I did this, did this a couple months ago. Yeah. Someone said, you ought to put it in LinkedIn. Just say you're a historian of the Jeffersons and, and, you know, just put some of your stuff on and see, you know, reactions. So they, obviously, someone at the organization saw that note. So they looked at it and they're like, that says that Leo was told by George Hallis that next year will be called the Bears. So Leo wrote, writes in his notes, next year Chicago will be known as the Bears, and he has it in parentheses. And so the, he has it dated. It was the second game of the season. So uh, they said in Chicago that officially it was never – they thought it was still up in the air what the team was going to be, and books have been written – and officially it was announced at the end of this, the very last game that they would be called the Bears. But he goes, this is the first viewing of the, Nick, the name Bears on a piece of paper um, months before they were actually going to be the Bears. So he's like, that's, that's astounding. Oh, my God. So that's got them, like, out of their mind. Thank you so much again for tuning into this special edition of The Smoke Break. I have to take another opportunity to tell you about my friends over at Manscaped and their brand new Lawn Mower 4.0. You can't say enough about this thing. It's my favorite male grooming product and I use it weekly. Should be using it more. I probably should be using it daily, but you can never use it enough. That's how fun it is to use. When did you ever think you'd have a male grooming product that would be able to charge wirelessly? Well, the future is here. The Lawn Mower 4.0 has a new electromagnetic induction system that allows the battery to charge wirelessly and also helps the battery last longer. Absolutely love this feature of the Lawn Mower 4.0. It makes the device that I use for my male grooming situations feel much more modern, sleek, and fun. 
And as I said earlier, some of my other favorite features include the powerful light that is built in, multiple different lengths, one to four different sizes, and of course, the ability to take it with me with that travel lock so I can take it anywhere I go without a problem. Order yours today on manscaped.com and make sure to use the special promo code FANATICS to get a discount on your order. Once again, that's fanatics at checkout at manscaped.com to get a discount on the all new lawnmower 4.0. I absolutely <laughs> unbelievable. And, and I said to him, I go, but the funny part is, I go, it, they could have, because they were playing at Cubs Park. Yeah. All right. And their baseball team was the Cubs. I go, they were, he might have just been joking. I mean, we don't know the context. I mean, Halas might have just said it in a joking way. Hey, next year we're going to be the Bears. Like, Saying it as a joke, mm -hmm. I, I don't know, or did he actually know? But it happened not it too long happen, after. But yes, yeah, so I mean, yeah, you can you can th you know think what you think, right? But, I mean, obviously we don't know, but it is it was enough to absolutely floor well, them, right? Because nonetheless, I mean, it is the first time Bears were coined the bears. or the name the Bears, the Bears, right? Unbelievable. So that's just the tip of the iceberg, essentially, <laughs> as we look across yeah, there's, yeah. this mini we could be here for days. museum. We could be here for days, but let's just talk a little bit about a little bit more about what we have in front of us. So okay, we Okay, so I just wanted to say that the yes. inventory list, which gives credence to everything, mm -hmm. obviously right now when I, I'm on LinkedIn, everybody's like, you know, he's full of crap. He's got all this stuff, you know. But the memo being attached to the inventory list wasn't just a memo. It was a memo addressed to Leo saying, Leo, could you give us an inventory? We're curious on what you have, signed Pete Rosell. So he, he's asking for an inventory list. You flip it over, and there's the inventory list explaining exactly what everything is. And then I've been able to document it with pictures and journal notes and letters that he's had. Without the, the inventory proof. list, you would not know what you have. No, right? no. And no. and it fell out of a program. That's when the you program. found it. Yes, that's the program. It was a it was a <laughs> Hall of Fame program, and it was kind of like folded up in a program. Right. Unbelievable. Sitting in front of me is something that I thought was incredibly interesting. Talk me through what's in this frame right well, we here. Look at it. Oh, the certificate. I was yes. gonna say everybody finds different things interesting, but yeah, the certificate. Um, this certificate has a story, as everything else does. How it made it here to this table is a shock, especially that certificate. Um, I did not have that certificate originally in that bo those boxes that I had. Mm -hmm. um, I had asked other aunts and uncles, you know, do you have anything from Leo, you know? And my one uncle in Florida had told me, I think I have a document, a certificate. Again, he wasn't a, a, a sports fan, and he's like, I think it's I think it's important. I go, okay, can you send it to me? So I'm thinking I'm, he's going to send it in like something secure. He sent it in and just an envelope, folded up no. in an envelope and sends it to me. I open it up and I almost fell on the floor. I'm like, that's a franchise certificate. Signed he folded by it up and put it in a normal envelope. Yes, <laughs> yes. What I think, I think, well, I will, that they did have, it already was folded. Oh, okay. It was, it was, it was folded because. But still a piece of mail you get in there is holding yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. So, again, but I don't think, again, that even the family didn't think, all, they grew up as thinking it wasn't a big deal. Right. Like the football, for whatever, I, I, it's strange because my mom, everybody, they, they kind of think it's cool, but they don't, it's not like, oh my God. Right. You know, to them it's like, okay, it's, it's cool, but not, oh my God, cool. So, yes, yeah, so I get that in the mail. It's signed by the first commissioner, Joe Carr of the NFL, and Carl Stork, which is priceless in itself. because there's, And that's an original NFL team franchise certificate. So I don't, you know, that's. So this certificate so. In, in itself recognizes the franchise. Yep. Co allows the franchise to be the franchise. Yes. They all had to have one of those. <laughs> and your great-grandfather's name is stamped on it. Yes, and Rochester Jefferson's, yep. Like we, the NFL, the National Football League grants Rochester, New York, an NFL team, Leo Lions, yeah. Out of everything <laughs> you have, what's the one thing you look at and you're just the most taken back by every time, if you could journal possibly notes. pick journal it? It is the journal notes. 
Yes. And we haven't talked about Curly Lambeau's money box. That's Now, that to man. me is amazing the way you figured out what it was. <laughs> that is the most insane <laughs> yes. backstory of anything that I have by far. So we'll what? go right to that. Do can it. I, can I, so there's a, a, a small wooden box mm-hmm. with a little nameplate on top. It has initials. So the thing has been on my mom's knickknack shelf for 40 years. I remember growing up and seeing it. And, and I remember one time asking my mom, well, what's that, you know, what's this box? You know, it doesn't match your other bells and whatever things you have on yeah. here. I go, what? She goes, oh, no, that was special to Leo. He always had that next to him in the living room. And he had very few things in his living room. He had the trophy. These are things I can remember, actually, as a kid. The trophy was on his mantle. There was a picture of Joe Guy and, and him on the TV, and it was that box. So... My mom always called it Leo's Cigar Box. (laughs) So as a kid, I don't think anything of it. As I get older, I'm like, it's kind of a small to be a cigar box, but whatever, I don't think anything of it. So as I started getting involved in the the football and the team researching, uh, one day I'm like, I'm going to look up these initials and see if I can find a player on the team with these initials. I can't find any. So I'm thinking, why would he keep this box if it, it's, they're not his initials? It's not a player's initials. I'm like, so again, I just kind of gave up. I'm like, well, whatever. It's just an old box. So right. along comes the journal notes, which, again, I think that one, floor of any of the notes that are shocking, and there are a lot of shocking notes, this one is the most because it tells me, well, before I say that, the box always had a sticky latch where you can't open it. You have to, like, shake it yeah. to get it to open with a little button. So, and it has a glass inside, which I thought was kind of odd. So, in the notes, dated 1925, Green Bay Packers versus Rochester Jeffersons. Uh, mentions a guy by the name of Lambeau. Doesn't call him Curly. I don't know if his nickname was Curly then or not, but he just says Lambeau. Lambeau throws three touchdowns against us. He was happy. After the game, they met, and Curly Lambeau kept the money from the Green Bay Packers in this box. The GBP was stamped on the top for the initials for Green Bay Packers. And so after the game, Leo writes in the notes that Curly Lambeau couldn't get the box open. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it has a, quote, sticky latch or sticky button or whatever. Yeah. And Curly Lambeau was going to throw the box away because he was mad. And Leo <laughs> told him, I'll take it. It's got a leather. It's actually a, a very intricate box. And I thought it yeah. was just no. It has a leather coating on the wood. It's very unusual. But it's back then, they didn't have safes and, and water. You know, they kept and they collect the money at the gate. Right. So the bo- the dollar bills fit exactly into the box. Wow. So Leo took the box. <laughs> so we're talking about the money that was held inside of that. What, yes, the we're- first Packers games, were, their money were kept in that box. <laughs> That's just like, what? <laughs> and I mean, it, the Packers, it doesn't get more historic when you're talking about Again, the yes, NFL. It yes. is the just, just <laughs> incredible. And then right <laughs> underneath of that, and I'll have a shot panning over as we speak about this. The first ever first aid kit used in the NFL, which also happens to be the first Johnson and well, Johnson. I think it is. I think one of it, it is. One of it's, for it's, sure. It's one of the beginning. Yeah, I don't. I think I started to research it and see if it was one yeah. of the first ones. It does say Johnson and Johnson box number one, but I don't know what that means. But I, th- I know I think they came out around the 1920s. So. So today we have the whole. Uh, every team's got their own, essentially their own health crew, staff crew, uh, right. up, up up the ante. Here we sit with the, however you want to call it, smaller than a briefcase box that was used <laughs> yeah. to treat the players on the sideline. Yeah. So, yeah, this box has been around the family. Again, just thought it was just an antique of his. Yeah. And it looks cool. It has, you know, the writing and everything on it. And it's like, okay. So every, as, as some of the other things have passed on to me. I got that given to me by one of my uncles. And so I just kind of like, I had it in my garage actually on a shelf. <laughs> Is it just kind of an antique? Before right. I got the journal, I just thought it was his old antique. Okay, along with the license plates that I have, which I didn't know. They were hanging in my garage. So the journal notes say, oh, that is the first aid kit that he used for the first six seasons of the NFL. Leo was the team doctor. So 
He would have this. He would have it, and it still has ointments in it. <laughs> wow. And not only that, there was a shelf in there. When I first opened it up, I'm like, there's no markings? Oh, no, I find a sticker inside saying uh, Rochester Je- property of the Rochester Jefferson's APFA, which was what they were called before the NFL, mm-hmm. and it has Leo Lyons on it, the name on it. Inside the, the box. The thing I found abs- the, the most <laughs> extraordinary out of all of this is the fact that everything you have, you have all you also have the written backstory of. That's it. what like memorabilia people are like. They have never seen this in the history of sports memorabilia to be able to. You have backups of your backups. Even some of the things have a third backup, right? Of either a photograph or something to prove what it is, and that's. I almost think that Leo did that on purpose. How As could he a not historian have? to to have like kept this purposely to have proof that what it was? And he had, like I said, I think he had to have because again he had foresight, just like he had a foresight of there was going to be a pro football league. I think he knew that it was going to be huge, and that's why he collected. The Chicago Bears told me, who else on the face of the earth would have kept uh, the first aid kit or the football? Who else in the world would have but Leo, who was there, and he was a historian. (laughs) And the amazing thing is the Hall of Fame as it sits today does not have anything like this. Uh, As far as they ever display, they've only show a a jacket, I think, or a blanket of Jim Thorpe's. That is it. And so on the 100th anniversary last year, I was hoping that something was going to come out. And I was actually supposed to speak there last year, but it was canceled because of COVID. I was going to be there not because of this collection, because at that time I didn't know what it was, but I was just going to be there as a great-grandson of one of the founders of the league. I was going to be a panel speaker. So, yeah, no, uh, supposedly no one has anything close to this in the world, as I am now finding out. (laughs) You will be doing that panel speaking this year. In two weeks. Let's talk about that. So what goes into that? You'll be off to Canton speaking. Yeah, it's going to be interesting, to say the least, because um, I've met uh, David Baker, who's the president of, of president of the Hall of Fame. Yep. I've met all the curators there. Um, they were super nice. You know, they, they got mad because I had paid a mission originally, and then the president guy goes out or whatever. The other guys are like, give him back his money. Do you know who he is? And I'm like, I was like I'm really nobody. <laughs> but, but he's like, no, no. He goes, you, your money's no good here. And, and he let us go into the uh, – archival room which is you know people have to pay a lot of money to go in there yeah he said you know help yourself you know do you know they pretty much let me have a run of the place which was really nice but at that time i didn't say anything about even the stuff i had the leo stuff because i felt like it would just be put in a box and stored away yeah and i'm like you know i'm not going to do that especially at a place where leo's name is nowhere in the hall of fame as uh, even on a plaque and Again, I don't hold it against them, and, you know, for wh- whatever reason it is, it is. I, everybody has told me that, you know, Leo pissed somebody off somewhere, and, you know, I think they purposely left him out. I don't know that for sure, but I, I really want to see his name in the Hall of Fame. So people are saying, well, now now maybe with all this stuff you will, but I don't even know if they will. I still don't know, but... I don't know. But so right now I'm just holding on to everything. But you're bringing his legacy to the podium when you go out there to give this speech. What's that mean to you to sort of go out and tell the story well, of your it grandfather? Feels, it feels great, but I'm not going to be I'm, – I'm on a panel, so I don't even think I have a ton of time to talk. So I'm not, I'm not actually going to probably talk about this stuff. I'm going to be talking about just the Rochester Jefferson's sure. and him being a co-founder. But – um, I did tell them, I, I think they are, I'm going to be there for four days. So wow. I think somewhere along the line, um, oh yeah, I was also contacted by board members of the Hall of Fame, 18 of them actually, uh, who are big like oil tycoons and you know they're, they're big people in the country. And they had seen the pictures and they're like, you know, how come this stuff isn't in the Hall of Fame? And I'm like, or how come we've never heard of Leo Lyons? And I'm like, I go, you don't know the story, and, and, you know, it even goes to the part where, you know, we could talk forever. George Hallis, in his induction ceremony at the Hall of Fame, mentions Leo Lyons in his speech. He's oh, no. being one of the guys that started the league, and it was guys like him that laid the foundation. I have stacks of letters from 
George Halas, Art Rooney, the Maras from the Giants, all these people praising Leo for starting the league. I have a co- commissioner from the NFL saying, Leo, the Hall of Fame is going to be opening. You are a big part of the league. All these people praising and praising and praising, and, and I got pictures of Leo there for the cake cutting ceremony. He's there for the coin toss on the field at the head at the fifty yard line, and you see all this history. And I go there and I'm like, "Where's you know? There's no mention of Leo Lyons. It says men representing Rochester. Hmm. That's how he's is in there. And I'm like, well, that's not right. You have a whole wall of fan of the year, and you have no mention of Leo. It's like. It just no, seems it, like it the hurts. movie's written it itself. Well, now, yeah. I mean, with all the stuff that I have now, it's it's crazy. You mentioned it hurts, and it would hurt me, too, to be in your situation to know that. What's your goal here? To to almost avenge what clearly seems like <laughs> something that should have happened a long time right. ago. Well, yeah. I mean, again, there's no ill will to anybody. I right. don't think the people that are around now have anything to do with that. Mm-hmm. And, it, and he can easily be overlooked because he isn't in – Things nobody knows these stories. I don't even know if. In fact, we talked to the one curator. He goes, "I've never heard of Leo Lyons," yeah. and I'm like thinking to myself, "That's pretty crazy because he was the NFL." Oh, a historian just told me the other day, and I looked it up to back it up. In 1922, he was at the meeting to change the name from the American Professional Football Association to the National Football League. Leo had a say in changing the name. Was that in the notes, or was that something you no, learned from this historian? Just learned, just learned. So I look it up, and there is Leo in in Dayton, Ohio, at an owners' meeting, and there was only a few of them, and he was part of that. And I'm like, he's like the Forrest Gump. He's there, yeah. heard all these things throughout the existence of the NFL, his whole life. It, it is without question, <laughs> as we talk here, you you cannot tell the story of the NFL without your great grandfather. It is impossible. No, the, there's license plates, NFL one. Those license plates, I've Wh- had those. Where do those come from? What are those? Those are Leo's license plates. <laughs> so they he was driving around with those on the on yes, the car. Yes, okay, but there's a story behind that. <laughs> Let's go. Thank God there's still a sticker on the one from the 60s. Yeah. I can't read what 60-something. I find out, in not the journal notes, but I had found out recently through other papers that I've recently found. There's so many pa- – I've got probably – 10 boxes of 100 photographs. I've got memos, letters. I, I mean, what I have is, is, is shocking. So me and my wife have gone through. I found papers that I didn't even see before. So um, I find a piece of paper that he had cut out of the newspaper. Mm-hmm. Those license plates were given to him by Nelson Rockefeller, the New York State governor in 1967. Rockefeller and Pete Rozelle, the commissioner, yeah. award him the NFL one license plate in a ceremony as being so involved in the NFL. <laughs> and now I so, have not only one year, I have two different sets of plates for the different colors. And so I don't believe you can even get that plate now, NFL one. It's been retired. So he's tooling to around it. town with NFL, NFL one. one. <laughs> But now, but then again, you're talking the 70s. Yeah. It wasn't, you know, the NFL is not like it is back in the 70s. It was more, it wasn't as big. But I think that makes it even cooler. It is cooler that he was driving around. That's how proud he was. Right. That he would have the NFL one plate. As I just scanned the table here, the other piece that I thought was amazing, as we're all used to the Jumbotron, under the one at the (laughs) Cowboy Stadium is the size of a house. Stopwatch. You have a stopwatch here that the games were kept track on. Yeah. Um... (laughs) <laughs> My mind is in a zillion pieces. Right? Well, yeah. So uh, that stopwatch had been around. It, it is a really old one, and it says foot-ball. So I, I knew it was an old stopwatch. Yeah. But, again, thought it was maybe just an old pocket watch he had. But it doesn't keep track time. It keeps track of seconds. It's only a second thing. Wow. Yeah, seconds on it. So come to find out that in Leo's journal notes says – that he had a pocket watch, a famous pocket watch that would not only keep track of time during the six, first six seasons of the NFL because there was no scoreboard, uh, he also would time Jim Thorpe and his punts, his kicks. Like the hang time of the There's punts? There's actually a photograph of Jim Thorpe at the Rochester game. And now you can see reporters lined up alongside of him. Yeah. He records in the, the note, the journal note, eight-second punt. 
That is, I think the the longest one in the NFL now is six or seven, I think. Like it hanging in the air, you mean? Yeah, hang, hang time. time. Yeah. He says. Eight seconds that thing's he says hanging in the, the air. the ball was up in the air for eight seconds. He has in the journal note. <laughs> the, the amazing thing here is it's not like you found this with the journal note and it all clicked. You had all this and you were just you were just like Well not the journal note. Didn't have the journal note. No, that's what I'm saying. Like oh. you had the stopwatch and you're like, oh just an oh, old right, stopwatch. Right. Had the cigar cigar box. Oh, just an old box. Puzzle. Then years puzzle. later you piece it together. Puzzle. Someone said it perfectly. It's a puzzle. It was a puzzle. That, that you've was, lived through. I've had my whole life all these pieces and then it was like the final piece was that memo with the, 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 you know, the inventory list. So, but the scary part is that that inventory list mentions a lot more stuff that I don't have. It lists really? three footballs. One from the first Buffalo game that was a Spalding football. It lists his typewriter. He had a typewriter that he typed on. Yeah, the list. <laughs> Take a look at this inventory list. <laughs> oh, my God. So are these things that you now are like, where could they be? Yes. <laughs> and That's what are you doing in pursuit of where well, these things might be? time, obviously. To look, sure. But it makes me wonder where. Now, it's very possible it got thrown away right. through time. I mean, maybe one of the footballs was deflated. Somebody threw it away. Now, we haven't really prefaced this, which I'm mean? reading here. <laughs> Telephone. Thorpe's call to Canton to start new league. You have the telephone in which the conversation was had to say, hey, let's start a professional football league. Yeah, not only that, he has the letter with the Canton Bulldogs letterhead and Ralph Hay and Jim Thorpe's picture on the top saying in the date you look at it, it's September 8th, which is two weeks before the NFL was started. Yeah. It says Leo, it's, a, it's a, a letter to him, signed Ralph Hay. So he, that was like the thing. And then the, with the dates on his inventory list, yeah, that was the phone that they called him to come to Canton to form the league. So, again, he felt it was so important that he would have <laughs> saved the phone. That's just what I was thinking. Who? Who? No, you, you don't. You don't save That's the phone. What, <laughs> but somebody who is obsessed with football and, and, and creating a league, he did. He, 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 like I say, God only knows what else he did, kept. That I don't have. That I mean, there's well, the amazing thing was it, it's almost like he was set on earth to do this at 16 years old. This vision right. was within him. I, yes. I don't know what, where, who. How does that happen? <laughs> right. And then to carry it out the to, way to be, he to did to become an NFL team. Yes. But he wrote it down, and most people that you you've come across in your life have written. So I'm going to accomplish this. Right. 16. This. This and this, and you do it to an extent that is beyond probably anything anybody could have imagined. This story can go so far. In, 19, in the 20s, while he had the NFL team, not only now he, he was running into problems with paying the college players, he turned to bootlegging. He was ended up being a famous Rochester bootlegger because <laughs> he lived on the lake, and he would travel into Canada to get – and he was shot at by the FBI <laughs> because he, he was bootlegging, but – Art Rooney mentioned that he saw you at the Cornell game. I trust you enjoyed it. Sincerely, Pete Rosell. There you go, right there. I, that, I mean, this is this right here is what I would imagine is the equivalent of a text message from yeah. Pete Rosell, where he's like, "Hey, you know that, that Art Rooney guy yeah. that you couldn't build the NFL around yeah. without that, without that guy? Oh, he he saw you. I trust you enjoyed the game. People, hey, we'll talk soon." People at work, I showed them that memo. They absolutely flipped out. They're so, like, it well, shows you right there how involved Leo was. That's <laughs> what I was going to get into because if people are questioning, like, okay, you have this ball, your great grandfather did this, did this, and this, you have multiple holiday letters that were sent directly to your great grandfather from Art Rooney that are very much like, hope the wife is well, happy holidays. Happy Easter, yep, yep. We drafted last this year. But I still think we're going to be okay. This is the Super Bowl champion Steelers of the time in 74, you had said? 74, 75, I think. Or Let's see that one card you have there. So 1974, team photo of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And <laughs> this is written from Art Rooney. He says, Dear Leo, hope all goes well. We are, we are of, let's see here. <laughs> 
cursive writing was was uh, uh we are no let's see we read it earlier now i can't i know Hope all's oh okay. we are we are okay we are okay <laughs> the 1974 steelers we are our, okay. Our team is good, and if we don't have, we don't run into any key men getting injured, we have a good chance to win again. <laughs> Hope Mrs. Lyons is okay. Good wishes always. Art. Art Rooney. <laughs> so, so, 1974. If none of our guys go down, we might win the whole thing right? again. <laughs> Just wanted to let you know, yeah, Leo. Yeah. And then in 75... And Super Bowl, uh, Pittsburgh Steelers. Yeah. Ho- uh, hope you are all well. Happy Easter. We are all. We are. Um. Let's see here. Oh yeah. We we, we are all okay. In the dr- uh, in the draft, even though we drafted last, right? So we did well in the draft, even though we <laughs> drafted last. last. Uh, good wishes, Art. <laughs> so. It, I just, I don't even, you and can't even Christmas process what you're reading. 75. And then look at the, I mean, look at this card. It, it's. It actually just says art in there. It just says art, but. But it's designed, like, it is a Christmas. Flips sti- open. Yeah. yeah flips open. So I had watched, uh, it was a Monday night football game, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago. Mm-hmm. And Tony Dungy, they were interviewing Tony Dungy. Yeah. And he goes, I have all my cherished possessions. The mo- the one that's the most precious is an Art Rooney Christmas card. He goes, I keep it on my mantle. He goes, that's bigger to me than a Super Bowl ring. In the and, Rooney and family, I got one. <laughs> it's unreal. You have multiple. You have multiple yeah. cards. Yeah. And Art Rooney, I mean, the family still owns the Steelers. It doesn't get more historic than the Rooney right. family. Clearly, the relationship your great grandfather had with Art Rooney was I, tr- a tremendous one. Yeah, I sent a letter to our or Dan Rooney Sr. Uh, probably 10, 15 years ago. Yeah. Because at that time I did have that. Right. And so I wrote to him and he said, yes, I remember my father going to the Cornell games with with your grandfather. Which, which grandfather. Roselle had mentioned. Right, yeah. So I thought that was really cool. Wow. So uh, you personally, I know we're, we're going, we got some length here, but I'm like we said, we could have sat here for three <laughs> days. I, I should have brought my jammies. <laughs> What is this like for you? I, I I think that might be lost here, right? It's everything else. What is this like for you? Okay, I think I think and this was brought up. This back in 1980 when I had these things first and I brought them out of the box, I had a photograph of Leo and Vince Lombardi. And we talk about the hundred photographs I have. Yeah, I mean these are guys, all the owners, everything. Um, it was an eight by ten of Leo, not that one. <laughs> it's over here, but the, oh here, right here. And what's not seen on the table, by the way, is a literal stack about a foot tall of stuff like this. <laughs> so here is, you want to hold that up? Yeah. Here? It's a picture of Leo with a young Vince Lombardi oh at an God. owner's meeting. I think it actually says it on the back. You Welcome National Football League. Yeah. yeah. Read it on the, I think it's 19. And everything's on, everything's on like pin boards. 62. 1962? Yes. Uh, 1962. Okay. Vince Lombardi on left. <laughs> Coach Green Bay Packers. <laughs> <laughs> so I Leo remember, Lyons on right. Yeah. So I remember taking this photograph to school with me and telling the kids, my great grand I just found out my great grandfather was like involved in the NFL. And this is, is that why you got an A on the assignment? No, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, but <laughs> just kidding. The kids are the kids are like, yeah, right. Yeah, I mean, that's not even Vince Lombardi. They go look, he's thin, and he's not wearing that coat and a hat or whatever. I'm like, well, he's inside, but they're like, that's not your great grandfather. I'm like, it is, and so the kids would laugh at me, and I remember being like, oh, brother. So I remember going home and then saying, forget it. I'm not bringing it back out. So a bunch of times I would bring it out, and people would be like, oh, yeah, that's nice. And I'm like, oh, I guess I, I, go, I think it's a huge deal, but everybody else doesn't think so. So You know what's funny? I don't think I've ever seen a photo of Vince Lombardi without the top hat and the that trench young coat. Fo- someone told me that that's a very rare photo of Vince Lombardi. He doesn't pose with a lot of people. So. And this is a very candid photo where they just seem to be in the middle of something. Of I have two of Do them. Do you? I have two, there's another one from another angle that he's actually laughing. Unbelievable. Vince Lombardi laughing photo, and it's it's pretty cool. But, so, so back yes. to what it's like for you in, in this whole well, lifelong even, journey, well, really. Lifelong journey. You want to even – my mom, who's a, an assisted living now, I've been recording her because I've been bringing up all this stuff, and mm-hmm. she's been, been thinking about a lot of things that she's forgotten about but brought up. She goes – 
she tells me the story of the trophy. When I was a baby, my mom would take me over to Leo's house. And I swear to God, this is like a, a movie. I'm, and I, it's corny, but <laughs> it's like she goes, and my mom would start crying when she tells the story. And it's like, Mom, wow. she goes, I remember going over to Leo's house, and Leo would hold you in his arms. Now, I was supposed to be born two weeks before March 11th. Leo's birthday was March 11th. Leo told my mom, maybe my Leo was a psychic, but I want to say it. Leo tells maybe. my mom he's going to be born on my birthday. Guess what? My birthday's March 11th. You share a birthday with your great-grandfather. I was born on that day. It took an hour and 20 minutes to get to that amazing nugget right there's here. so many. Wait, but there's more. Okay. I believe you. So, so <laughs> my mom says when I would go over, or it would take me over there, that he would hold me. Are you ready? That trophy which used to be chrome. Oh, it's right here behind me. Hi, Leo. Yes, yes. Here it is. Whoop. was chrome. It's lost its finish in the last hundred years. So it really shined, yeah. It's shiny. Well, guess what? He would show me that football every time I came over, and I was drawn to the football because it was bright yeah. and shiny. How ironic now that he's holding me, looking at that football, and now here it is on this table, and I'm doing all this for Leo. It's like... <sighs> It's almost like destiny. It's everything about your great grandfather <laughs> was destiny. When yeah. you when you bring the psychic no, thing up, I'm no, actually giving some credit no, to that. No, I really died. <laughs> As I said that, it kind of like dawned on me. It's like, yeah, I think he might have been a psychic. Yeah, because, you know, he knew that the NFL. Like, who else would keep the telephone? Like, he, I totally believe he knew. Well, no, wait a minute. See, I have so much head. It just comes to you, head. right? It's got so to. much in my head. Yeah, he said in the newspapers, and I clipped him out. He's saying. The end, their pro football will be huge. It will be bigger than baseball. He was saying that in 1920 when the NFL was just starting. So guess what? He's collecting all these things because he knows that it's going to be big. That's why the other teams threw the stuff away because they didn't. They weren't sure. They'd be like, well, whatever. It's just a football. He or was so certain. We don't even have all. I mean, told the story about the helmet, and I don't even have the pants of a player that played against Babe Ruth. We haven't even gotten there yet. What's up with the helmet? Okay. Because <laughs> I don't even think I've thought okay. to think of the helmet right. yet. Well, the football helmet, always thought it was Leo's because it was with his stuff. Right. So I've been going around on TV show. Yeah, this is Leo's old. It actually has the old draws. That's all they used. It was like a string, a stretchy thing. Yeah. So I'm like, this is, this is Leo's football helmet. Well, the journal notes said otherwise. The journal notes say that it's from Joseph Nigberry. So... I start researching Joe Nigberry. Yes, he played on the 21 Jeffersons against the Bears. We looked, and we can find an N and a B on the back of the helmet. You can barely see it. <laughs> yeah. With the flashlight, you can see it. There's an N and a B in there. Yeah. Uh, the pants I also have, but I don't have here because they're falling apart. Right. Um, Is that one of the oldest known helmets? No, I don't think so. The helmets were, they were more common. Okay. So I would say no. I would say no. Maybe the one of the oldest NFL helmets. But possible. you look at it, and you're just... Yeah, you can see. So when I put this on LinkedIn, mm -hmm. and we also found his initials in the pants, only because last year, two years ago, it was at a museum in Rotch, the Strong Museum. And it was stuff for the 100th anniversary. It actually, Scott Burke told, Birch told from the Bills. Okay, yeah, yeah. He, we did a, a thing with Josh Allen's uniform. In Leo's uniform, 100 years wow. uh, difference between the two. Yeah. Okay? So as we it was on display, part of the hip pad was falling out. As I moved the hip pad out, I found an initials NB in the pads. Yeah. So it was Nick Berry. Yeah. So I put it on LinkedIn. A historian from Cooperstown says, Mr. Stephen Hagen, do you know who Joe Nick Berry is? I go, yeah, he played on the Rochester Jeffersons for in 1921. He goes, do you know he played baseball? And I go, no. I go, I don't. I don't know 1920s baseball. So he goes, let me fill you in. He goes, Joseph Nigberry was a player on the New York Giants baseball team in 21. I go, okay, that's cool. He goes, well, that 1921 Giants team wasn't just any old team. He goes, that 1921 team won the World Series that year. I'm like, oh, well, that's that's cool. Now, this is three months before he signed. Leo recruits him to play for the Jeffersons, yeah. okay? 
That 1921 team that beat or won the World Series beat Babe Ruth and the New York Yankees, the Yankees' first World Series appearance. Wow. And I have his uniform and helmet of Joseph. So Nick his Curry. legacy goes way beyond the Rochester Jefferson. Yeah, and I think of all the things he kept, Joe Nick Berry, I think he thought he was going to be a star because he has it in his notes. Yeah. Well, that was one of the things he got wrong because – he, he said he's going to be a star. He actually quit sports altogether like a year later. But he was in Pittsburgh. He played for Pittsburgh. He was a huge – the University of Pittsburgh. He was a huge star. And, and I think that he was like – wasn't into sports. But I, Leo always thought it was. But that's the story of this uniform. That yeah. I, again, I always thought it was Leo's, but it's this Joe Nick Berry. So walk me through the last few months for you and like okay. ever since the – realization of what you had been sitting on for so long. All right. Well, like I say, I, I, once I got all this stuff, I'm like, I don't know how to get it out there. Like, I don't know where to go. So I'm like, I'm going to create a LinkedIn page and, you know, say I'm a historian of the NFL or Roger Jefferson's and I'm just going to post some pictures. And then people were telling me you shouldn't post any of the pictures because people are coming after you. <laughs> so I'm like, well, that was the next thing I did. We made sure we got all this stuff out of here. Right. And I pay good money for a security firm to hold this stuff in a climate controlled, you know, a museum type of situation under security with, you know, protected from weather or floods or fires. So that's good. So I wanted to get it out of here. So as I started posting the pictures on LinkedIn, I started getting connections. Bo Jackson was one of the first <laughs> NFL player, former NFL players that friends me. I'm like, wow, that's cool. And then I posted the cleats, and suddenly I have Jerome Bettis. I've got all these NFL players friending me and commenting on my things. So, and then Dan Marino, who has been my all-time idol. Oh, yeah, I'm not a Buffalo Bills fan. I'm a Dolphins fan. Oh, we were saving but, that for the end. <laughs> but, but I absolutely, the Buffalo Bills are the most classy organization. I've met so many people from the Bills that it's like every single one. Daryl Talley, too. I mean, yeah. Class, class, class. But, um, see, now I messed myself up. Where am I going? You were talking What's about like, your LinkedIn, LinkedIn and everybody so kind of yeah, connected started, with it's you. Been, it's been taking off now. So then I started getting memorabilia people saying, you realize that these are one of a kind in the world. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's cool. So it's it's been snowballing. Every single day I'm getting contacted by, you know, news organizations. And now it's getting bigger and bigger. But people still – haven't I've just did my other news story yesterday, and now you're the second one. I think a lot of people are skeptical. Yeah. So ESPN executive director contacted me, or I contacted him. I said I have an incredible story to tell. So I tell him, and he's like, "It sounds really interesting. I'll, I'll talk to other people." But then after I sent that, I'm like thinking to myself, and then I actually wrote back to him yesterday. I'm like, "Sir, I'm like, I can't stress enough." I can't tell you in an email what I have. Right. It's like this is definitely documentary type things, but it's so much. And then with Peyton's places, yes. Uh, the writer contacting the writer, they were going to do a show, and then the NFL does not want me to do a show with that because even though it's not their items, they're already worried about me how I present it. Right. <laughs> So they don't want it in a comedy type setting, right? The history. So right now, every that's the million dollar question everybody's asking me: Are you selling it? Are you loaning it? I've already contacted the Smithsonian; they want me to donate everything or one of the things. And I said, "Well, can you guarantee me that it's going to be shown?" They're like, "No, I can't. tomorrow it can be put up on a shelf." And I'm like, "Well, then we're done because I want this displayed." Yes. So that's when I'm going to the Hall of Fame now in two weeks. I want to sit down and talk to them, but explain to them what they do is they do collect the stuff, and it's showed for a little bit, then it's put away, and they do preserve it forever, which is great. But I believe NFL fans should see this stuff. This is course. the history. So I honestly don't know what to do right now. <laughs> yeah. So And i got people now from China – from Israel, I got uh, around the world. People, collectors, saying, you know, they're interested in my this collection. And Are you I, bringing this all with you to the Hall of Fame? No, no. <laughs> so everybody's telling me no. no. I'm bringing a few things. I'm bringing pictures of everything, mm -hmm. but no, I'm not bringing everything. <laughs> I, I wouldn't 
you know, if I got in a car accident or something. Right. These are like one once in a lifetime things. So sitting here right now, like, it, do you have any semblance of what the end game might be, or is it all just a mystery? Total mystery. I have no idea. I mean, people have said that Leo should be inducted into the Hall of Fame as a contributor. Sure. And as I come to find out, he actually was nominated during the 70s several times as a contributor. But I don't even think Leo, like, brought this stuff to the attention of I, – I don't know. I, again, I'm only guessing. I don't know what was happening then. Yeah. I, I feel like Leo, he was friends with all these big guys, but then I feel like the Hall of Fame, there was something going on there, but I have no idea. But the end game would be I'd love to see him inducted, and if at least not inducted, there should be something there. A plaque or even anything is is for his involvement in the NFL. It's unprecedented for what he did and it, what little he did or what he had. He had no money. He worked three jobs. I mean, he was put in the the league. Uh, yeah, I mean, he was. It's um that that to me was an amazing <laughs> point you brought up. Right. I mean, he wasn't even working three jobs for himself. He was working three jobs to, to make this a, to make a reality, work. right? And that just speaks to the the passion. I mean, and it really kind of speaks to the fact that he, like, he was born to do it, and right. he and he made sure it happened. Yeah. And who knows what things would be like now? That right. that to me is the amazing thing. So yeah. before we wrap up, John, I, and I and I hope we did this somewhat justice. I don't know if we'll ever be able to do it full justice. <laughs> What's the one thing that, if, if you sat down and, and someone asked you about all this? Your grand, your great grandfather, the, the the memorabilia, the story. What's the one thing that you would want to say on it? What's the one thing that you would want people to remember from this whole thing? I would say this is my great grandfather's life. It was his life, and I feel like I'm the only one now that knows it, and I want to get it out there. So media, I, I want people to know who he is. I think it's 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 deserving for someone who spent his life committed to the NFL. And, and again, I have all the people that were involved in the NFL actually saying it. Yeah. But, again, nobody knows who he is. And so I just feel like he was always on the just the edge of everything. He was just like right there, but not quite. So I feel like now with all this, it can change. And I want people to know who Leo Lyons is. That would be the all. If, if I would trade all this – to have people, if, if I could just somehow magically do it, and people know, and, you know, it would be, you would respect him more. It would be, you know, he was somebody. So I, I guess it's safe to say the one thing that would to be remembered, Leo Lyons. Yeah, that's all it's about. That's, yeah. I mean, I could, somebody could offer me $10 million for this stuff, and it, it, the money wouldn't, if I took the $10 million, I know he would haunt me till, right. till my dying day, you know, but... It's not about it's not about that. It's about Leo. It's the, he collected this. This is his. Yeah, it's basically his life, on his right here in his big giant collection. It's his life. That's been a major part of yours, and it's absolutely amazing. Yeah, John, I really appreciate you inviting me in, taking me down memory lane, and giving me and everybody else a glimpse at what is a mini. NFL museum on your dining room table yeah. that I hope one day everybody really does get the chance to see in person. I hope so, and I thank you. And I'm really, really happy that you were, you know, kind to come here and, and, and do this. And Pleasure's all mine. It's not every yeah. day you get to see the <laughs> one and only existing football from the 1920s. So right? me and John are going to hop off air, and I'm going to dive way more into this stuff. Um, I'm going to take pictures and videos so that everybody can see what is in the collection. And uh, once again, John, Beyond thankful, and I hope we did this somewhat justice. I hope we did Leo somewhat justice. Yes, thank you. So, you did, thanks. You did, thank you very much. Thanks so much, my man. All right. Invited me in. This was great. John <laughs> Steffenhagen, the great grandchild of Leo Lyons, the co-founder oh, yeah, he's of the National the Football yeah. League. Yeah, he's, yeah. Doesn't get more amazing than that. Thanks for watching, everybody, John, for the third time, and I can thank you a million times. Thanks for the experience. <laughs> thank you. Unbelievable. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in, everybody, and we'll see you on the next one.